Hey, Oscar. Yeah? When you get a loan, you don't have to use it for exactly what you say you're gonna, right? Yes, you do. No, but I mean, once the bank gives you the money, it is your money. You can use it for whatever you want, right? No, Kevin, that would be fraud. Let's say that you tell the bank that you're gonna open up an ice cream store, but instead you buy an ice cream cart. Technically, you're still selling ice cream. I know you have gambling debts. Gambling debts? What? Promise me you will not take out a small business loan and use that money to pay off your bookie. What's a bookie? I don't even know what you're talking about. You are weird. You are a really weird dude. TBTL! Look, I get it. I'm not always fun to be around. I can be loud and abrasive. My breath. The doctors say I have incurable stink tongue. I really dug the way you use fantasy current events and cooking in a kind of tapestry of storytelling. Lady Gaga said she's addicted to it and is not harmless. Did you ever think that maybe there's more to life than being really, 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 really ridiculously good looking? So I'm nervous, but I'm excited at the same time. Um, so I'm just gonna start talking about what I like and hope I get some replies. All right. Hello. Good morning and welcome everyone to a Monday edition of TBTL, the show that just might be too beautiful to live. Get medium play on three independent radio stations in Central Europe. My name is Luke Burbank. I am your host. Ooh, brother. Ooh. Coming to you from the Madrona Hill studio perched high above the mighty Columbia. Very nice to be back home. I was in L.A. and Palm Springs for most of last week. I will say the weather here, not great compared to... You know, you to, like to get wet, though. Compared to Southern California. But uh, it's, you know, it's nice to be back here in the Madrona Hill studio where I've got all my little bells and whistles and uh, just feel like I'm ready to turn in a really quality, quality episode of the show here as we kick off the week. It's episode 4,169 in a collector series. Let the fun begin. Speaking of... Top-notch broadcasting, of course. Andrew uh, made a, a major media appearance on Friday on the uh, local public radio station there in Seattle, KUOW. I've been very curious how it went. He was a bit a bit apprehensive going in. And well, what did everybody think? Mom, can we go to bed without dinner? Yes, we can. So we will hear about that. Also, it's baseball time. The crack of the bat, the roar of the crowd. That's right, baseball's back. But we are not going to have a conversation about baseball, my friends. This is the second show in a row, I believe, I've used this exact device. We are going to have a conversation about maybe the funniest bit of interior decorating I've ever seen a minor league baseball team employ in their sports bar concept. How funny is that? That's pretty <laughs> funny. Something very, very clever has been done by the Portland Pickles baseball team and we're going to get into that and we're going to get into all of it with this guy the longest running cobro of the show maybe best known for his depictions of the tall ships i'm looking at him through our special video connection and he looks real different on this monday morning here's my sweet stash let's freaking party he's andrew walsh and he's joining right me right now good morning my friend good morning i don't really love the way i look in this particular view Got to figure out how to um, move the camera around in the studio so that it's high enough that it doesn't get my huge double chin that is now exposed, but low enough that it doesn't just focus on my male pattern and baldness. Do they make a it's camera? It's a narrow for that? band. It really a is a narrow band of attractiveness. But I feel like we have the technology. You've uh -huh. got a uh, 4K Logitech camera that I think is up to the task. I I just want to jump right into this because I did text you over the weekend. Full disclosure to the listeners, I did text you over the weekend to ask how it went. And in fact, I believe I may have even texted you at some point on Friday. What I know is that you had this big appearance on the Weekend Review on KUOW, and you really wanted it to go well. 
and you also mentioned to me that you had a shaving incident. Yeah, I actually t- texted Friday you on Friday. I couldn't help. I okay. knew you had your own stuff going on, too, on Friday. You were on a big fancy shoot, I believe. But I had to text you about the twist because I was making such a big deal on this show about how nervous I was about doing this radio appearance, appearance you know, part of a roundtable of people on this mm-hmm. Week in Review radio show on KOW, something that I always wanted to do. But then once I was invited, I felt very, very nervous about it and had some true anxiety about it. Um, and I, th- I honestly do think it's not unrelated that um, my beard had been getting a little bit shaggy. And so, I mean, that's, that is unrelated. That has to do with just human growth. The nervousness did not promote follicular growth. Yes. And I was stood in the mirror and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to trim my beard down. That'll make me feel good. I don't really love the beard mm. trimmers I use. Um, and so I did this thing where I was going to really do it right. I, I combed my beard out. So I looked absolutely bananas. I looked <laughs> like I should I should have been institutionalized. I combed my beard kind of backwards, if that makes sense. So it's sticking out everywhere. And I'm like, that. I'm going to give myself a really nice, careful trim. Um, But I was so focused on combing my beard out and then maybe thinking ahead about my appearance on the show that I... You were also blasting the song Needle in the Hay by Elliot Smith (laughs) in the back. At what point do you become Luke Luke Wilson from the Royal Tenenbaums in this scene? really dark. But um, I had the razor on the completely wrong (gasps) level, the wrong setting. And okay. so I'm trimming my beard, and I'm thinking, oh, this sort of feels funny, but it's because I've combed it all. I, I'm kind of going more in depth than I usually do in my beard maintenance or whatever. And this is how many hours before the show? Before you're this is actually late the night before the show. Okay. So I was okay. sort of like, okay, this will be the last thing I do before I go to bed. And I ended up, and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, this is not right. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, dude, you have your you have your trimmer on the completely wrong setting. I I I kind of stroke my beard down, and I just have these bulge. Bold spots on Did either you side mutter, of my face. I know you like <laughs> quietly to yourself. Like I had the one perfect heart on my right cheek. It was actually really impressive for an accident. But I, I looked like, I looked like somebody who was struggling <laughs> with a lot of things. I looked terrible. I, I, I trim it down as far as I can. So then I just sort of trim everything down pretty far, and I go upstairs. And Genevieve's watching TV on the couch. And I'm like. Genevieve, I might have made, uh, and then I walk into the room, and she just has this "oh, sweetie" look on her face, like what, what has happened? I'm like, I can't, I can't pull this off, right? I can't keep the beard short with these bald spots. She's like, no, that that doesn't look natural, and they're on both sides of your face, and so oh, wow. I was just like, I'll just sleep on it. She's like, you could just leave the mustache. I'm like, May- maybe, I'm not sure. You know, you're talking to a person who pioneered the tiny wig 2000 technology, <laughs> That's Andrew. That's true. You completely ignored the obvious solve, which <laughs> is build a go to your local wig. CVS, go into the department where they sell various hair colorings, find a swatch of mm-hmm. pretend hair that's roughly the color of your beard, steal it, yeah. bring it home, cut it, hot glue it onto a barrette, and you just seamlessly fold that right into your beard pattern. Something I have literally done in my life, that's, but not for my beard. That is funny because it's sort of what I ended up... I ended up turning this little beard situation into a bit of a radio win. If I had one good moment on Friday, it was because I was able to talk about my beard in a, as an analogy for the city council. I'm not even joking okay, about that part. what? But, I, I'm listening. <laughs> but so, I, to, just to go back to the moment... Though, Non-existent? So I, is that what you say? Yeah. Like, What's that? You know, I feel like we've really well. Well, I'm saying if you don't have a beard anymore, were you saying like my beard? The city council well, is non-existent on this issue. Uh, let me. I'll t- explain what happened here, and then I can okay. tell you about the the analogy okay. that I made. But anyway, so I, I come upstairs, and Genevieve just has this look on her face, just like you know, she really wants to support me, and she's like, maybe you can make it work. But I can see in her eyes that she cares about me, and is like, don't. Uh-huh. And I realize this is getting a little bit far afield, but you know, I'm a little bit, I guess, I guess embarrassed is the right word about how much I talked about my anxiety about going on the radio for one hour you know like when we were talking about it last week like it shouldn't have been that big of a deal but it really was I felt a lot of anxiety around it and it had been growing in the weeks since I knew I was going to be on the show um and uh I I I I think that a big part of it I sort of realized wasn't just me being on the radio but also me going into a workplace for the first time Mm. in a long time I know that sounds weird Luke I mean obviously you're always flying around you're on camera all the time I don't I I don't want to pay myself I told you I gotta do this exact show this Friday and the only thing I'm worried about is 
how am I going to be perceived when I oh, ask yeah. for a visitor pass? Right. Like it's right. the it's the human interaction component of all of that that's actually what I'm a little bit anxious about. Yeah, so I totally understand that feeling. I I went to grab a cup of coffee um, beforehand because I I wanted to you know me I wanted to make sure I wasn't rushing in there at the last minute or potentially being late. Um, so I took the train into the area where the station is, and then I got a cup of coffee at a coffee shop nearby while I had like 15 minutes to kill, and I didn't want to be there super early. And I I realized like how nervous I was. I like went to drink my coffee and it spilled a little bit i'm like oh my god um and i realized oh this feeling i have i it's not a feeling i remember from going on the radio this is a feeling i have before a job interview i hadn't mm -hmm. had a job interview in a really long time but i do really think it's like i mean yes the pandemic changed the way a lot of people felt about going into work but you and i have been doing this show i haven't walked into like a radio station as a and i know i wasn't an employee in this situation mm -hmm. but like i haven't walked into like a professional setting in a long time where i had to actually give at least the cursory thought about what i look like and now here i am the night before with bald patches in my beard a beard that i yeah. had i think nonstop for 15 years now like i've always thought like i like shaving and i've been tempted to shave it but i truly don't like what i I don't like what I look like underneath the thing. So um, I, I kind of Well, I want to like, say this, if I can. I think you look very nice without your beard, but I also think you wear the beard well. And mm -hmm. it's certainly the way that I think of you in my mind. So yeah. I, 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 I don't think that it's like, uh, like you can't pull off not having a beard, but I also think it's a nice look on you. And it's kind of your signature move. It took seven months to grow and needs half an hour's grooming every morning. And that's sort of what I was thinking. I was like, boy, my, my beard, or as I thought about it over the weekend or whatever, is like any like little TBTL illustration of us, any kind of mm -hmm. um, headshot or whatever. We need, by the way, I uh, need at least three months before we do any headshots, <laughs> heads up. Because I think uh -huh. I'm going to probably keep this for a while. But anyway, what happened was I came down the next, I'm like, let me just sleep on this. I don't want to, I don't want to do any more shaving tonight. <laughs> but I will say this. As much, Let me sober up as much and, uh, as, and see what this looks like. As much as I was like nervous about going on the radio, as soon as I made this mistake and mm. I went upstairs and I looked at Genevieve and I'm like, okay, I'm just going to take a shower and then go to bed. In the shower, I was not fretting the way you might think. I was actually sort of laughing to myself. I'm like, this is <laughs> this is legitimately funny. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do about it yet. Either I'm going to shave my whole face or maybe I'll leave the mustache. I'll see what that looks like in the morning. But I'm just like... No matter what, like, this is legitimately kind of funny. This is just a funny story. And, like, I know it sounds weird, but I think our conversations – don't take this the wrong way, <laughs> and I mean that. But, like, our conversations about how you sometimes feel about your face or how you look, when I look at you and I'm like, I don't see what you're seeing. I don't see why you're anxious about the way you, Luke, look. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like – and I often tell you, like, I've just gotten to a point where I kind of <laughs> just realize my lot in life and I am who I am. And in a certain way, maybe thinking back on that conversation, I'm just like, listen, if I go in there and I say something really stupid on the radio that I can't take back, like, that's going to feel really awful because that's, you know – because I should be good at this or better at this or whatever. But if I go in and I just look like I got a fat face, it's like, that's my face. You know what I mean? Like, uh -huh. as long as I was a little bit nervous about having been, you know, having not shaved in so long that if I was going to shave away part of a beard, I might have a bunch of nicks on my face. Or, you know, mm. I didn't want to come in looking like <laughs> like I right. crawled my way off of the <laughs> sure. sidewalk. But I got to like, say, my initial reaction to this mistake when I realized, oh, my God, I got to walk in there looking somehow drastically different tomorrow – I really was just laughing at him. I'm just like, of course yeah. this is it. And it sort of took my mind off of maybe the bigger Absolutely. picture a little bit. I know exactly that that moment of, because we're trying to hold so tightly to the way we want this experience to go, whatever the experience is, or whatever the event is, or whatever the thing is. And I, I, I'm so with you on this, where it's like, I want to control every single thing. And I feel, I feel like if I just stress about it enough, and I prepare enough, and I control it enough, it'll go exactly how I want it to go. And then sometimes there's a point where the sort of dam breaks mm -hmm. so irretrievably that you just kind of laugh. Yeah. Like, Okay, well, that plan is out the window. Yeah, the right. idea of me controlling every element of this is no longer really realistic, and there is something very liberating about that. And that's when I put on a bunch of white kind of clown <laughs> makeup and uh -huh. dyed my hair green and just went through the streets of Seattle laughing Can you, around midnight. C could you introduce me as Walsh? <laughs> exactly what I said to Bill when we showed up. So I, I so anyway, the next morning I wake up, I'm like, yeah, Vives, same deal. This is not tenable, right? I still had the bald spots in my face. She's like, yeah. So I like, well, I'll shave everything but the mustache. Might as well just like keep on working in that direction. If that doesn't work, mm -hmm. then I'll 
shave the whole thing off. But I ended up leaving the mustache. And here's another way I think it sort of helped me was when I got to KOW, I was still pretty nervous. But then I kind of I'd worked with one of the other guests for a while. And the other guest was very charming. And Bill's very welcoming, the host of the show. And so I did start to feel a little bit less nervous. And I do think mm. that like having been invited on their podcast version of the show for, you know, I don't know, several times over the past year really helped. Like, I think I was mm-hmm. more nervous the first time I did that, weirdly enough, which is not live and not in the studio. So anyway, so by the time I was in there, the the one other thing about this mustache is they said, bring a computer with you because we do stream this live on YouTube for a very small part of our audience that still wants to watch us do this on YouTube, a holdover from the pandemic era. So first of all, like, I'm like, oh, shoot, like my computer's so small, it's going to be laying on the desk shooting up at my face. So I think you would have been proud of me. BYOC? Everybody bring your own computer and then like turn off the <laughs> audio on it, but just so we can send the video feed out to like, I don't know, a hundred people Boy. who watch it live on YouTube. Times are tough over there at KUOW. <laughs> I know, right? It's I was funny. splash out for a couple of Logitech Brios. <laughs> I, I almost thought like, should I just bring my own camera? That's like, no, that's ridiculous. I mean, but what I did do, which I think you would appreciate, was like the second they said that in the email the day before, hey, bring your computer because we're going to put this on YouTube, I thought to myself, I ha- my first mission when I get in that building is find some books so that I can yes, l- sir. put my computer up. And when I was in the green room, we're all leaving the green room. I'm like, I think I'll take this book on African art. I believe I'll take mm-hmm. this book about <laughs> the wo- the work of Nora Ephron. I don't know what uh-huh. I grabbed. I just grabbed a couple of books yep. and, and brought them into the studio Smart. with me and stacked them up. I was proud of that move. But I'm bringing in two key lights and a glam team <laughs> when I go in on Friday. Oh, yeah. Actually, that is ridiculous. something. You'll grab the same books. Um, I uh, <laughs> Anyway, so, I, so I'm so i sitting there, Luke. We, we have, you know, we're in the studio maybe five, ten minutes before we go live. And I look so different. I look so different to myself hmm. that the whole thing just seems so funny to me. It almost felt like I kept on catching a glimpse of myself out of the corner of my eye. And it it felt like I was cosplaying. It literally felt hmm. like I was in there. Like, I, I think that part of my nervousness went down because I didn't feel like myself, if that makes sense. Huh. I was like playing yeah. a different character or something. I can't quite explain it. But in a certain way, I think this weird mistake. You were just dissociating. I was really at the highest level. I was looking at like, so do you know who Asher Perlman is by any chance? A New Yorker cartoonist. You've probably seen I don't his think work. So. I think it's, I think he goes by he. Um, but anyway, look it up if you care or yeah. whoever. Look it up. He always, you know, it's New Yorker style cartoons. You know, uh, in, you know, just ink cartoons, um, black and white. But he always draws a little character that I look like. Just middle aged mustache guy it appears in almost every single one. I don't. I, he may he may even have a name like Doug. I or do recognize, like that. by the way, these yes. these uh, these cartoons. Uh, very much so. You're looking at them now, yeah. And I'm looking at you'll them, yeah. see a lot of me in them. And I just kept on thinking, like, I'm that guy from the cartoon. Like, I just I look like that. Yeah. So I'm gonna. Here's the other thing I realized: I miss shaving. Like, I think I've even mentioned that on the show mm. before. That like, I don't like. I like having a beard the way it looks on me, but I miss the process of shaving. So I went out and I bought some new razor blades. I think I'm gonna just gonna keep this for a while and see if I can keep on pretending to be somebody else who I like more. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that this. A kind of accident ended up sort of working for you. Um, but I also would like to hear how you made uh, a connection between your beard or lack thereof and the Seattle City Council. <laughs> so I, I, um, I wanted to be careful not to come. You want to come in with things to say, right? But, you know, mm-hmm. you and I were just talking on the show recently. Also, like the lesson I learned in my uh, in my college speech class is like, don't assume you're sitting on some sort of comedy gold and wait for wait for somebody to laugh or to force a joke in or something. But right. I, I run into this, by the way, sometimes when I'm on the program, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me mm-hmm. with panelists that will remain nameless. But there are a couple of folks that will I can see that they've they've sort of made a list of some stuff that they if it comes up, they want to get to it. And then I, I can observe a certain, maybe you might say shoehorning in of it mm-hmm. or a, uh, we, now the whole conversation has moved on and the, the classic would be like, you know, a couple of minutes ago we were talking about Hiroshima yeah. and it just had me thinking, it's like, okay, the moment is past. I wanted to just... roll out my best Hiroshima material. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, honestly, I think that's <laughs> that was the problem, more fundamentally though. the issue with the joke. <laughs> yes, I would guess but, uh, so. Um, so I'm kind of embarrassed trying to recreate this, but I, I was, one of the issues that I knew we were going to talk about was this idea of um, people getting back into the office because it's good for the economy, right? Mm-hmm. And I knew that one of the people I was on with, who's the head of the Chamber of Commerce here, um, 
she and the city council believe very strongly that like we need to incentivize companies to compel their workers to come back into the office because we're losing too much tax revenue by not having a busy bustling downtown. I love a busy bustling downtown, but I don't think going backwards in time and trying to ignore the fact that like technology has evolved how we work should be the way that we build cities back up by doing an old uh-huh. way of doing things. Now, whatever. I don't want to get in the whole thing. I'm not against an employer saying, hey, for our type of work, we do better when people come in the office. I think that's up to the business owner, Mm -hmm. managers or whatever. But for the city's plan, for our city leaders to be saying the way we get out of this is by having businesses force their people to come into work downtown just seems so, I don't know, acronistic to me. I I think I'm saying that word. Anachronistic? Anachronistic to me, or just like looking backwards, like you're looking for leadership here. So anyway. You're thinking of the Akron groomsmen again. I am. I'm constantly thinking of the Akron groomsmen who are ahead because because there have been two games played so far, and I'm the only person (laughs) in my matchup who had players on those teams who are now. Yeah, right. It's all going to come crumbling (laughs) apart in a couple of days. But anyway, um, so I had been thinking, I've been trying to, I felt very strongly about this, and I'd been trying to think of a good analogy, Mm -hmm. um, and I had a couple that I was sort of clicking around in my head, but then this thing happened. So I went in there and I, and I, again, I had sort of thought of this as I was heading out the door in the morning. And I said, as we were talking about, I'm like, do I have time for a quick analogy? And Bill just kind of like, all right, Mm -hmm. go ahead. Like whatever. And so I'm like, all right. So like I, and then I told the whole story briefer than I have here about how I accidentally shaved this bald spot in my face. Nice. And I'm like, I had three choices. I'm like, I could like, you know, choose to shave my entire face, which I didn't want to do. I could come in with bold, bald spots in my my beard and assume you guys wouldn't give me a hard time about it but I didn't really want to do that I'm like I could try this mustache thing I'm like so I tried the mustache I'm going with that right now it's not the perfect solution but for right now I'm just a mustache guy I'm like but if I had called the city council they probably would have said scoop up all the hair and glue it back onto your face so that was uh, the, hey. that was my big analogy and it didn't I didn't I wanted to make sure I didn't jam it in there and I wanted to make sure that it wasn't like and then I paused for laughter you know what I mean uh-huh. but it ended up I think it ended up going over as well it should and even the woman who like kind of you know on paper disagrees with me the head of the chamber I said maybe Seattle just has to be a mustache city for a while she's like I will not be running that by the members we will not be calling ourselves Seattle the mustache city so it was a good I, you little... know what I like I like I like so much about that I like that you got personal got real mm-hmm. with the KUOW listeners because I I'm guessing that that is not the usual speed for that show. Mm. Um, so I think if I was just listening and I heard that, I would like be like, I can relate to a person having kind of like a some kind of a you know we that's not quite a fashion emergency, but somebody having some sort of personal grooming emergency mm-hmm. at the worst possible time. I like the the scooping up the hair and gluing it works as a. I think that was a really good. That was a that was a, a nice little. Um, bone mo there so yeah so that was fine i did i i would i won't tell you that there weren't other moments in the show like not big deals and we don't have to get them in we don't have to get into them here but like just a couple of times where i sort of felt like i dropped the ball a little bit or i, I there was one like on one issue i was like saying things that i don't even really totally agree with but i was a little bit nervous and out ahead of myself mm. but it wasn't as bad as it could have been like i've seen myself i've heard myself truly nervous and truly like there were a couple of times i slid out of control a little bit that you know throughout the weekend would ping into my brain and literally I would win it's like oh shit why'd you say that but like I know but those moments I know were way worse to me than uh-huh. than than other people and and like there's just one moment where I literally felt like I let Bill down I was like oh damn I had more on that. I just couldn't think of it in the moment. And so whatever. But the show was fine. Like Bill probably thought, oh, this isn't going somewhere. So he moved on to something else. You know what I mean? But like in my Mm -hmm. head, I just wanted to be the good boy. I wanted to prove that I could be a professional. I'm I was when you texted me, I asked you over the weekend how this went. And you said, you know, sort of what you just said there, which was like not nearly as bad as it could have. And you haven't you weren't as beset by Mm -hmm. kind of like intrusive thoughts as you might have otherwise been. And I I just cannot tell you how much that made my weekend Mm. like because and it's not even that you did well or didn't do well, because I knew that you would do fine because you're good at this stuff. But I didn't know how your brain would interpret the Mm -hmm. event. Like it was almost like the performance is to- is irrelevant to like how my friend Andrew is dealing with things this weekend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the idea that like it kind of um, that, it, that that you were able to to realize that it, it was it was fine uh, made me really happy uh, for you. I was struggling with my own demons this mm-hmm. weekend of in- of serious entitlement that I had to I had to really take a moment and check myself. We were um, in Palm Springs. 
doing a story. I sent you some photo and video of this. I was like, this is maybe the greatest reporting assignment of my entire life. Uh, because you went into I love the jungle this. looking for Colonel Kurtz, right? I did, and yeah. I found him. Congrats. That was, Thank that you. was a plum assignment. And he was standing next to D.B. Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Andrew, I'm sitting on a couple of Pulitzers right now. Oh, nice, nice, fantastic. Yeah, I cracked a couple of big cases over the weekend. I um, uh, I I love Palm Springs, and I also really love like mid-century architecture. And uh, so I was in Palm Springs doing a story about this guy named Albert Frey, who designed a lot of the stuff in Palm Springs. He was originally from Switzerland, but he ended up really kind of like making his long-term home in Palm Springs and um, just designed all this really cool stuff, including this thing called the Illuminaire House, uh, which he actually designed when he was living in New York State. And it was kind of this like prefab idea. I kind of talked about this on Friday. I know more about it now because I spent the weekend talking to folks about it. But it was this idea of like a prefab aluminum house that would be really functional for people and that you could build a lot of for cheaply. And it would kind of create, a, you know, a, a, a good quality way for a lot of people in the U.S. to live. It would solve a certain kind of housing problem that was happening a lot like in the 1930s. Um, the Illuminar House didn't really take off, but they've reassembled the original version in Palm Springs and put it next to the art museum. It's part of the Palm Springs Art Museum now. So we were doing a story about that. But it just so happens that this guy, Albert Frey, also built a house for himself above the art museum, up on this, you know, kind of sort of rocky outcropping that looks over Palm Springs. And it is a glass box with a boulder coming into the space. Like the house is built around this massive boulder and it has a swimming pool and this like insane view of Palm Springs. And it's, it's essentially like, I, I, I talk about like sort of a coat hook moment sometimes, this idea that I've had that like, I'll just find the exact right coat rack and then I'll have a coat on there and then I'll come in from a, productive day and I'll hang the coat up and I'll feel a certain way or I'll be going out to an adventure and I'll the other kind of snapshot moment that I have of my life is living in the Hollywood Hills although now I could sub in the um, hills of Palm Springs in some like mid-century glass box with a swimming pool and sitting there and like having a martini and dipping my feet in the swimming pool and gazing out upon the city and somehow feeling okay for five minutes. I know what is would happen. Is the BoJack is, Horseman music playing underneath you in this scenario? Constantly. Or does that come later? I'm talking in every phase of life, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. Right now. Yes. Literally right now. I was going to start it sneaking it, but I think, at first of all, I'd, I've made that same exact joke before, and I didn't want to get you off track too much by just having mystery music come in underneath you. The thing I know is about myself is that if I ever got to this moment of life, which I really feel like is sort of the apotheosis of my life, at least when I'm in a when I'm in an unrealistic place, what my brain tells me is if you just can do whatever needs to happen for that moment to exist, then you'll feel OK. Then you'll feel like enough. Then all of the the there's just stuff that that the bedevils me that bedevils a lot of us will go away because because everything's perfect in your life. Rationally, I know that that's not how life works and that I would literally sit out there and there would be like probably an hour of being like, it's happening. This is really it. And then after an hour, I'd go, OK, well, what's next? Mm -hmm. And I would just be the exact same person I am. I now have a new fantasy, which is the Frey House 2, which is what this is technically called is the second house he built there. That's now my new fantasy is living in this house, which is impossible because it's part of the permanent collection of the Palm Springs Art Museum. But Andrew, when I tell you it is so so up my alley, so incredibly just like cool, in my opinion, from now, I will say this, the, the word on the street was he built this. This guy, Albert Frey, lived in this house into his 90s. He had a bell installed down by the parking area so people could ring it because what is one of his favorite things to do was wander around this house naked. Hmm. And he needed some way for people to let him know to put some clothes on. Good, good thing to do if you live in an all glass house. <laughs> I mean, I, what I would imagine is at this actually to this day, but particularly in those days, there was nobody for miles. So I think he probably just felt like it's pretty safe. Um, but like. I, I guess at some point he, I don't know if he married or he took, uh, you know, he had a, he had a, a, a companion, um, a, a, a woman who moved into the house with him. And uh, the story was he had to expand the house because it was like such 
a rudimentary glass box with a swimming pool that he loved. She was like, I refuse to live here unless you add like a legitimate bedroom. It was like a studio apartment for years and years. So it's kind of an interesting space because it's not even, it's not that it's really fancy. It's very like Spartan. Like it doesn't have a lot of storage. It has, it's, it's, it's the kind of thing that if you're like an obsessive mid-century design fan, kind of like I am, it's, it's, you're very into it. All that is to say, we were going up there to get what we call B-roll. So it means that we're not, I don't have to do anything on camera. I'm not standing like by the swimming pool being like, check this out. Because the story was not about this guy's house. This was just extra footage. But I was told we're going to go up there and we're going to, and we, you know, had of course our camera crew and our sound guy and, and, uh, and it was like, we're going to get to just kind of like have our run of the place. And I had seen photos of this house and I was like, like, Basically, I could have flown out early because now we're at the phase of the story gathering where I've done all the interviews that I'm supposed to do. I and, and oftentimes, if we're just down to getting some some B-roll shots, if it's not really important that I'm there, I might take the opportunity to start my my journey home. I stuck around for this, right? Like I was like, oh, we're getting a special tour of Frey House 2 and we're going to set up our cameras and we're going to get all this footage. I was like, I am not missing this for anything. And we get up there. And there's like three or four cars parked there. I'm like, that's weird. And there's just like people hanging out in the house. And I and I, I'm sort of like ask our producer like, well, hey, what do you think is going on? And and uh, she was like, well, um, there's supposed to be we're supposed to have a half hour window between the tours uh, of the people being up here, but it doesn't appear to be the case. And I realized that like sort of there's all, so many groups involved in this thing. They're the people that are helping us, CBS, get our TV story about the Illuminaire House. And they're from a PR firm in Los Angeles that specializes in art projects, right? So they're visiting, and then they're interacting with the museum people. But then there's this other wing of the museum that like charges, I assume, a lot of money to drive people up for tours of this spectacular piece of architecture. And it's a Saturday. And the Illuminaire House is being, the ribbon is literally being cut so it's a big day to be checking out all things Albert Frey. And of course there's going to be tours and of course they're going to be busy, but we get up there. The first, the first tour that was there leaves mercifully, but the guy's car isn't big enough to take everyone from the tour group down. So now there are three people left, Andrew, just three normal folks who paid money and were excited, I assume to sort of go on a tour of this thing, but they were sitting right by the swimming pool. There's like this built-in bench. And I really wanted to get like a cool photo of the swimming pool. Like just not even for TV, for myself. And they were sitting there. And the ra the woman also said something. The woman seemed very un... There was, it was two guys and, and a woman. And the woman seemed kind of mid on the whole thing. And one of the things she said was, yeah, it kind of smells musty in there. And I... When I say that I wanted to throw this person into the swimming pool... How dare you mess up my photograph I want to take? How dare you think there's anything less than spectacular about this thing that I hold so dear? And how dare you even take up any space in the world right now? Those were the thoughts that were coursing. And I wanted to go over to our producer and be like, literally like, could you do me a favor and jettison these people off of planet Earth right now? Like the anger that I felt was so disproportionate to what was going on. The amount of anger I should have felt was a zero. <laughs> Any amount of anger for me to feel or annoyance would be an overreaction. But the amount that I was feeling was a massive overreaction. And yeah, I had I'm to guessing that if these people also were giving off a different vibe, you would have had a different feeling about it. Like if they were if the guys were wearing ascots or like I don't know what exactly, but if they looked like kind of part of a designy crew or even a crew that you might have even more mm. aspired to like kind of bro down with, you might have thought differently as opposed to if these people look like kind of like they didn't mm. deserve to be there in your mind. I don't think that was it because there were people that looked like that and I was mm. pissed at them too. Okay. I was anyone who was messing up my the way that I imagined this was going to go was we were going to have exclusive access to this thing that represented something way bigger in my mind than just like a guy built a house and liked to walk around in it naked. Um, <laughs> uh, which if you say it like that does sound really different. Guy built a black, a, a, a guy built a, a, a glass box house and liked to walk around nude. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you were dusting uh, for butt prints. 
Yes, I was. And they asked me to stop. <laughs> um, they said, sir, <laughs> please put that black light away. It's, <laughs> it's scaring the people who paid to be on the tour. I had, since I knew this was going to happen, since I knew we were going to go up there, I had made this into something in my mind that I was going to have a certain kind of experience and it was going to be revelatory in some way. And when anything changed that, when there was just people, I was there was a security guard there. Like, okay, of course there's a security guard. You're letting people into this. There should be someone to make sure that nobody does anything they're not supposed to do. There was just, there were tour guides. There were cars that were not from the 1960s. Yeah. Everything that was interrupting my preconceived idea of how this was going to feel for me felt like violence. <laughs> and it didn't help that the people lounging by the pool didn't even seem like they were enjoying it properly to me. But it was less about if they looked like people who get to enjoy this house and more about just like, well, if you're not even enjoying it, if you think the house is musty, if you're scrolling on your phone right now, could you please go do that down the hill so that I can take off my clothes and mm -hmm. wander around this house mm -hmm. nude in the style that Albert Frey would have appreciated? I think that these people are heroes in a certain way by <laughs> simply being there. <laughs> But I will, listen, if I can give myself credit for one thing, it was that in the moment of this happening, I actually identified what was happening for me. Because I literally wanted to walk over to our producer and, and say to her, like, what, like, what the hell is going on here? Like, why in the hell are there people here who are not part of our crew when we were promised this exclusive access, et cetera, et cetera? And then I realized, well, that's because we live in an imperfect world and because everybody wasn't talking to everybody else. And also, this is literally going to be five seconds of the story. It's going to be one drone shot of the thing. Like we And we got everything we needed. And everybody up there was very happy to step out of the way if our camera guy, Scott, needed to like get a certain shot. Like Everything that was happening up there was totally fine and completely useful for what we needed. What it wasn't working for was this weird fantasy that I had going into this about how it was going to be for me, like independent so the, of my. So the producer and I, I had that question for you. So the producer and camera people and other crew who needed their shots, th were they put out at all about having to work around people? Or did they share no, any agita at all? Or were they just like, I oh, know this is fine. Our producer had a little bit of agita because and I joked about pushing the woman into the swimming pool. The woman who was sitting on the built-in bench by the swimming pool, there's a very narrow, because of this house being built into a rock thing, there's not a ton of like square footage. Everything's a little tight. And if you were walking along um, the, between like there was a very narrow walkway between the swimming pool and where this built-in bench was, where the people were sitting. And when, and our producer and I, um, we were standing, Aria and I were standing kind of over in one thing and she walked along to get to another part of the of the of the yard if you will or the patio of this place and the woman who was just trying to be funny who's sitting there who seemed kind of, who said it was musty pretended to push aria into the pool and it was like just one of those silly jokes that wasn't it wasn't even funny it was kind of like duh mm. and then later i walk and she pretends to push me in the pool and aria goes that just got funnier every time she did it <laughs> so we were both a little like hmm, this would be easier for us mm -hmm. Uh, and more pleasant for us if maybe we had a little more of our run of the place. That being said, our camera guy and our sound guy, because the thing you really need to be a camera person is like equanimity in the world. And you need to just be the kind of person who doesn't get annoyed with stuff. Because to be honest with you, the camera person and to some degree the sound person on one of these shoots, they're doing the hardest jobs <laughs> of the whole thing. They're carrying the heaviest equipment. They're being asked to do something that's technically really challenging, but there's a creative aspect. They're, they're the first ones there because they got to set up these lights for hours. They're the last ones to leave because they're putting all the gear into the car to leave the truck. Like, it is a, a very hard, very challenging job. And if you're, if you're wired the way I am, if you're just some kind of entitled, <laughs> an <laughs> annoying person the way I am, you will not last as a network camera person. And so, of course, Scott, our camera guy, was completely unfazed by the whole thing because that's just he has just developed that ability to just move through the world and get his job done and get along with everyone and just like do stuff that none of which I have like naturally occurring in my in my personality. But I will say at the moment where I was like about to have some kind of a meltdown, I was I was I was I don't want to say proud of myself, but I was relieved that something inside of me said dude, what are you doing right now? Like, how dare you be this annoyed at something 
that is not that big of a deal. And also, we're getting everything we need. And also, it's very cool. I mean, those videos that I sent you, I was getting plenty of access to this place. Like, nothing bad was happening to me other than it wasn't exactly what I had expected. Um, and... I, uh, and, and I didn't feel, I didn't feel great about the feelings that I was having afterwards, but I felt at least relieved that I interrupted the cycle a little bit. Mm -hmm. I did not, I was not familiar with any of this before you were telling me about it, but I was Googling here. I did not realize that Frey House 2 is spelled T-O-O -O, and that there's a third mm -hmm. one called Frey House Now, just yeah. like the Look Who's Talking franchise. Do you know uh -huh. which came first? Yes. I think the one with Kirstie Alley. Okay, gotcha. Whichever one of the houses Kirstie Alley lived in. How bummed would you be to like original. do all this research and then you finally read it for the first time and it's Frey House, comma, T-O-O. -O. <laughs> How much of the magic just sort of sloughs away? Uh, Palm Springs' hottest club <laughs> is Frey House 2. two. I have I have so much other like minutia I could bore you with about my time in Palm Springs, including what is clearly a glitch in the matrix of whatever mapping programs like Lyft and DoorDash use. I did not have one interaction. Uh, I did not have because I, I didn't rent a car when I was there. I was just taking lifts back and forth. I did not have one lift ride where the mapping program seemed to work for the person getting to me without like watching the little cartoon car go way in the wrong direction. And then the timing being like, they're going to be here in one minute. Wait, they're going to be here in 20 minutes. Wait, they're going to be here in 15 minutes. There's something, there's some sort of radio interference in that town that was causing every time I had to get in one of those cars to be an adventure. The people were all super nice. Like I had very good experiences with everybody who I was riding with, but there's something I've never seen a town that were like the entire whatever the map program is is broken in Palm Springs. So were the drivers actually going way out of their way because they were also victims of this technological snafu, or did it just appear that they were doing that on your app? Because I'm just wondering, did you ask them like, is it hard to get around here with these with this technology glitching out? I didn't ask the Lyft drivers because I didn't want to seem rude or put off. Mm -hmm. Like when I got, I didn't want to get in the car and go, "Hey, why did you go?" Why did you why did you take a route that seemed really like it didn't make sense? Because I can see, you know, how on on Lyft in the app, it'll show you this like colored line that indicates where the car is going to go to get to you in the most efficient way. And then I would just see the car going and then all of a sudden that line would jump up by a block and then jump up by a block as the car was going the in route a more is changing not just the, the route car. was changing yeah, yeah. but i but but i don't know what when i say the route was changing it, the route was accounting for the fact that the car was was now taking oh, a longer way to get to me. does I that see. make pat, sense yeah pat like it's, it looks like i should take a right here the car didn't take a right here so now it's saying it's going to take the next right the next right the exactly next right, yeah. that just kept happening and it was fine i mean none of it was catastrophic to my schedule but i didn't really want to say like, hey, what was up with that? Because I didn't want them to think I was really that put out, but it was just weird. But then on Friday night, after we'd been filming all day, I was trying to get back to the hotel. And the first thing that happened was I uh, called for a lift. I was standing out outside of a like a some kind of restaurant there called Tropical in Palm Springs near where we'd been filming. Oh, did and you get any um, pens? I've been literally, since I brought you back some pens from the Tropical, the look, they have those perfect little clicky pens that you like. I've been That's to, where you got it I've from? been meaning to write to them to see if they will ship me some because <gasps> that was my secret gift to you, but it's been like five or six years Dude, and I, I never did that. Dude, I was standing in front of that place. Uh, I wish and you I totally had gone in there and just smurfed a couple of pens. Well, I'm sorry. Next time, yeah. I will. And I, well... It was bachelorette party central, Andrew. Uh, I was, I did, I was like, I, I'm, <laughs> peace and love to everyone who's celebrating the, you know, celebrating their time with their friends in advance of their wedding. Peace and love. But wow, that, there was a, a lot of bachelorette parties. There was one point where I'm waiting for the lift. I'm going to use a, a word here that's a little edgy, but penis. one of the people, uh, <laughs> one of the members, Smurf, I'm going to use the word <laughs> Smurf, like this bachelorette party one of so many goes into Tropical. And again, I was just, I just wanted the lift to have a reference point, right? So I was like, oh, this, okay, cool. I'll stand in front of this. I didn't even put it together that that's where you got the pen. And um, so some of the bachelorette party is standing out on the street. And then one of the members of the party, I guess their table's ready because the place was jumping. And all I, I'm just like looking at my phone, watching this car that's supposed to be coming to get me just go like further and further and further 
away from the predicted route and this keeps going from like it's one minute away to it's six minutes away to i'm like you're just driving to palm desert now mm-hmm. i think right i eventually canceled that ride by the way because i was like I think this person decided they didn't want to drive Lyft right now, and they just forgot to turn it off. Like, there was a point at which they were now 20 minutes away from me. They were driving the opposite way from me, but I was, but they were still somehow logged in. Do you ever and reach the mid- out to them? On the rare occasions I that I got that, sometimes I'll, like, you know, text the driver, like, hey, are, is there an issue with the ride? It, it looks like the map has you getting further and further away. Did you try that at all, or did you just not feel like messing? I just canceled the ride, and when it told me that it wasn't going to charge me for canceling the ride, right. I felt like we all knew what was happening. Okay, yeah. Yeah. The app knew, because usually if you try to cancel a pickup and it's too close, they'll be like, it's five bucks. Yeah. This was like, you know what? We get it. Something's okay, up good. with this person. Yeah. So I just, now if I wouldn't have been able to cancel the ride for free, I would have texted and been like, um, are you still planning to come get me? But I didn't have to. I just said, meh, that's all right. I'm going to, this this person doesn't seem, for one reason or another, they don't seem that into doing this lift ride right now, mm. considering right now they're somewhere near Indio, California. They're somewhere lost in the Antelope Valley. Mm-hmm. I'm just mentioning repeaters for KCRW now, Andrew, <laughs> nice. in case you're scoring at home. Nice. Um, so in the midst of all this, as I'm like looking at the phone, one of the bachelorette party people, just a woman, she just like sticks her head out of Tropicana and goes, get in here, bitches! <laughs> and I just... I hadn't felt that bad since an hour earlier when I was at the Frey house <laughs> and uh, was not being able to do everything I wanted. Uh, I was like, oh, my God, that is that is not a way of relating to the world that I particularly appreciate. And you but, think it's um, because she had just discovered the pens? I think that's kind of, yeah. yeah. Their, their table wasn't ready for hours. <laughs> but she was like, get in here. Look at these She's pens. She's a 10. Look she was like, Andrew They're asked me amazing. to smurf a few of these pens. They're amazing. Get in here, bitches. We're getting some pens for Andrew. <laughs> They're clickers. But, um... So, so then I've now like canceled ride number one because that person's in the wind. And now I sign up for, uh, I, you know, the, assigns me a new driver. And it's a guy named Gary. And Gary is an interesting character because, A, Gary's driving a truck. Have you ever had a Lyft pick you up in a truck? Rarely, but like I can, I can remember the last time a truck picked me up. It was after I think after an airport trip, and I um, took the train to like whatever the closest train stop at the time, which was the university like um, stadium exit. It's just okay. so hard. You just know the reason I'm being specific is you know that area. It's so hard to navigate around there. Uh-huh. There's no you know like split roads, yeah. many lanes. You can't take easy yeah. lefts. It's just like a pain. And I remember I'm waiting for my lift, waiting for my lift, waiting for my lift, and then it shows up and it's a it's a pickup truck. It was yeah. like a big pickup truck with like a you know I I think I said I must have sat in the front seat with them. But yeah, it was it was sort of some strange. of those will have a cab in back. I assume that they have to have a cab to get approved for lift. Right? Yeah. Don't you think? You know what? I, I can't think imagine I did sit the... in the back. I think I sat in the back seat. Um, so I, I see it's Gary. He has pretty. He has a, a what we only just could only describe as an Andrew Walsh esque mustache, mm-hmm. except it's gray, mm-hmm. and he's got like suspenders on. He's kind of got some sort of wildish gray hair and not a lot of hair on top. So this is Gary. He's in a gray pickup truck. So I'm looking, and finally, you know, five ten minutes later, a gray pickup truck with Gary in it pulls up in front of Tropical, and I'm like, great, Gary's here. I go around to the truck, and I don't know if I've ever had this happen. There's already people in it. Oh, wow. There's four more bachelorettes, Andrew. Bachelorettes, really? <laughs> they come pouring out of Gary's truck, and I'm, I'm feeling weird because I'm standing really close to them. I was like, I think uh, this I'm the next ride, although I've never had that. This Whatever the system is that these things use, it rarely has it where someone dropping people off is also the person picking you up, in my yeah, experience. Yeah, that's pretty it's efficient. But, I mean, it's a handshake. very small town, right? I mean, that, that's what we're getting into here, right? Like, it's just... I mean, there's a lot a of different. people driving Lyft because there's a lot of tourists there. I mean, the mm-hmm. whole town is tourists, mm-hmm. and most of them don't have cars. So so they get out, and one Batsarette says to me as she walks by, she goes, I'd buckle your seatbelt. And I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. I, don't know what, I, don't know, I don't know what to do with that information. What are you trying to tell me about Gary? But all right. So I so the the last person out of the truck shuts the door and I'm getting to the back door and the truck starts pulling away and I'm like banging on the truck and I'm banging the truck stops and I go I kind of look now remember I've already canceled one of these rides now Gary's here and I'm looking and I'm like this is Gary this is a hundred percent Gary he has suspenders on he's wearing suspenders in his Lyft profile photo and he's wearing suspenders now this has got to be the same Gary. Mm-hmm. 
And license plate I, says Gary and it has dice on the mirror. Thank you. I mm-hmm. mean, so I, I, I like knock on the window. He stops kind of a little bit stunned. And I kind of open the door and I go, hey, I think I might be your next ride. And he goes, huh? And I go, is this you? And I'm holding my phone and I'm holding a picture of Gary. And I show it to Gary and I go, is this you? And I wanted to say, are these the same suspenders? Mm-hmm. Like, what are the chances this isn't you? And he goes, oh, okay. And then he looks on his phone and he goes, Trace? And I go, no, I'm Luke. <laughs> not only did he not have me as his next customer, he had someone named Trace who was supposed to be his next customer, but I'm looking at him on my phone. This is what I'm saying, Andrew. The whole system was bizarro. Like, it was, it, and eventually it refreshed and he was like, oh, okay, Luke. And then, like, he was like, go ahead and get in. He gave me a ride. It was fine. He had been a heavy equipment operator. He did do this one thing, though, that um, is totally fine, but it's just, it, I'm surprised when people do this, which is, I, I, guess the, I guess how I would describe it is maybe assuming that people know more than they do. I think I have a problem of maybe assuming people know less than they do, which can probably get into an annoying kind of pedantic mansplainy type of thing. God bless Becca for suffering through the my many long tangents about subjects I'm only minimally informed on. But there's this other version, or this other side of that coin, which is, so I was just making small talk with Gary about heavy equipment, and I was like, I was like, so heavy equipment, like dozers and stuff? And he goes, oh yeah, dozers, uh, you know, what he starts naming heavy equipment I don't, I don't know about. And then I'm just trying to think of follow-up conversation. I'm like, how do you, and I actually have wondered about this. I was like, how do you know if you have actually dug up enough dirt, but not too much dirt, don't you feel like it's weird that these bulldozers, I'm now talking to you, Andrew, this is not a continuation of my Gary conversation. Like someone's building a house, like a couple of houses over from me. And they had all like the like bulldozers and earth movers out there. And I just always think, man, that seems like a really challenging job and really precise. Like you're scraping the earth, but you don't, it's gotta be a certain, like you can't go down too far, but you also, you know what I mean? You, you got to like scrape out a certain amount of this, but it needs to be level. It needs to be a certain depth. There's like a bunch of stuff that I would have a really hard time with. And he goes, oh, well, uh, he goes, no, we have a system for it and blah, blah, blah. And he goes like, um, he goes, do you know the area? And I go, not particularly well. And he goes, well, he goes, you know, up on uh, I-107, up on that ridge up there on I-107, I did all of those houses. And I just thought, in my life, have I ever said to someone the equivalent, someone I've just met, like, well, you know, you know, I one Oh seven, all that Ridge up there. Mm-hmm. Like I have never assumed anyone had that kind of information ever in my life once. Like, because I, because I didn't, cause I don't know where I one Oh seven is. And what are the chances I would know where I one Oh seven is or what the Ridge is above I one Oh seven. What must it be like to go through life thinking that a random stranger in your lift who just told you he doesn't know the area would be familiar with a particular Ridge on I one Oh seven. That would be amazing. That would actually be shocking. If I knew that information, he might've been on autopilot. I wonder if he just, you know, he, he has to, doesn't have to, but it sounds like he makes small talk all day during his shift or whatever. And so you know, some of those things might just kind of come out on autopilot, sort of, you know, like you maybe kind of although we were having a conversation. Yeah, maybe so. I also maybe you thought I was Trace. Maybe Trace knows about that. Well, stuff. where's Trace? That's what I was going to ask you. Like, do we have Dufresne. any sense? Exactly what I was thinking. Do we have this <laughs> Trace still looking? just standing in a corner somewhere just waiting? When when that gal yelled, get in here, bitches, Trace just went into Tropical. <laughs> yeah, Trace is just like sort of I am part of the Bachelorette party around. now. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I feel bad for oh, Trace. Oh, uh, okay. I, uh, we, we do need to thank some dazzling donors. And then, uh, and then I really do. I, I spent the whole weekend resenting people who were at Frey House 2 and watching people roasting J-Lo on the internet. And I want to talk about this a little bit with you, Andrew. It's not usually the kind of thing we get into on the show, but I think there's something interesting going on here. So uh, after we thank some dazzlers. We was hoping for some razzle-dazzle. Razzle-dazzle. That's right, man. Razzle dazzle. On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody razzle dazzle. Hey, let's thank some dazzling donors. These are the incredibly generous, supportive, wonderful people who are making TBTL possible with their donation of a dazzling amount of dough. Starting with Rachel Howell, who's an Broomfield, Colorado. Rachel. We met Rachel in Denver. We sure did. Rachel says, hi, friendos. I'm grateful that I was able to dazzle with my donation this year. I've listened to TBTL since 2010. 
Ah, a newcomer. Rachel, mm-hmm. welcome. Welcome to the listening audience. Uh, I honestly don't know what my life would look like without having my five-day-a-week dosage of mm. Luke and Andrew. If your um, TBTL symptoms last for more than five hours, mm-hmm. ask your doctor if your dosage of Luke and Andrew is right for you, Rachel, is if the your, thing I would tell you. If your TBTL episode lasts for more than five hours, definitely Today's talk might. to your doctor. Yeah, I We're know. I realize 54 that. minutes in, mm-hmm. and we haven't even gotten to J-Lo yet. Yeah, I know. One of our dazzling donors. Uh-huh. Yes. Oh, God. Well, mm-hmm. she's doing... She's she's She needs to go on a PR offensive, uh-huh. and I think it starts with dazzling TBTL with her donation. Uh, Rachel says, I'd like uh, to promote uh, the National MS uh, Society fundraiser and events if any tens are looking for a new charity i would advocate for that uh so the national ms society um yeah i know folks um i know folks with ms and i know particularly in this part of the country in the northwest there's a a high occurrence of ms so it's greatly it's very likely that a lot of our listeners have been touched by this in one way or another and it's obviously a really really worthy cause to um to help support so uh Rachel is suggesting the National MS Society. There is a website listed here. It's nationalmssociety.org and slash chapters yeah. slash cal slash fundraising hyphen events. So Exactly. And if you didn't get all of that, and if you're somebody who's really what do you interested mean? in... How could somebody not get all of that? <laughs> it's a complicated address. But if you are looking for that email and you don't feel like rewinding your podcatcher, um, just email me and I'll connect you with this link via Rachel. Absolutely. I bet you if you Google National MS Society Fundraisers and Events, you'll get mm-hmm. there as well. Uh, Rachel says, finally, a big thank you to my amazing husband, Matt, who claims to be a 10, but is really a 10.5. Hmm. hmm. Shots fired, hmm. Matthew. Uh, Rachel questioning your TBTL. Do you go with bona fides or bona fides? I was going to say bona fides there. Yeah, I think bona fides. That's one of those ones, though, depending on... I hear different people say it different ways. Yeah. And whoever I heard it say last, if they seem like a smart person, that becomes my new my new default until I hear someone else say it differently. Yeah, I don't think I've probably ever said it the same way twice in a row. Right. <laughs> yes. I probably yes, always that's... alternate, yeah. Uh, Matt, uh, who uh, claims to be a 10, but might be a 10.5. Uh, thanks for being cool with my great love for TBTL and my yearly donations. Yes. Smiley face. Thank you, Matt. You are Matt, a hero. I'll make you a goddamn five if you want. As long as you, <laughs> as long as you don't make any trouble for us in the donation department. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, please keep up the good work. Dummies, you're loved. Signed, Rachel from Denver. Hey, thanks, Rachel. That's so sweet of you. And yeah. thanks, Matt, also, um, for, um, for being cool with this whole thing. Maestro? On your mark. On your mark. Get set. Get set. Now ready. Ready. Go. Everybody rattles, rattles. Hey, look who it is, Andrew. Yeah, it's my buddy. Your friend and mine, Anna Anafi of Seattle, Washington. One time right. week in review yes. uh, guest, I believe. Yes. Full time leaf clearer <laughs> from <laughs> her neighborhood. Greenwood. Yes, exactly. Sometimes. Uh, uh, leaf, uh, uh, what's it? Leaf uh, policy resenter. That's right. The, in her neighborhood, the deal was not like cleaning up all the leaves, like from the gutters, are good, but then kind of being punished for dispensing of them in a proper way, right? Yeah, like yeah. let's make it easier for the people who are doing a great kindness to the neighborhood, trying to keep the sewers from blocking up, by making it easy for them to get rid of those leaves. Anyway. Anna's moved past all of that and now is focused full-time on TBTL support. Mm -hmm. Anna says, while I only became a regular listener in 2020, whoa, that is... Yeah, I didn't quite (laughs) realize that, yeah. I mean, Bone Ammy hasn't scratched yet. Did I make... I think I made that reference on the show recently. What is going on with me and Bon Ammy? I don't know, were you you greeted with this amount of silence? What are you talking about? I, I really was not sure... Oh, you know, the, you know oh, the clean- it's that wood floor it's cleaner. It's not wood. It's, oh. it's, uh, well, I don't think of it as because it has a little bit of grit in it. It's like a powdery cleaning thing that we used to have like weirdly a lot of when I was a kid. Maybe oh. it's for floors. I don't know. What I know is that we would put a little bit of the powder on something and some water, and then you would use it to get out, so, I don't know, stuff that was hard to get clean. But, but the thing was the can 
had a chicken coming out of an egg or something and it said hasn't scratched yet i'm looking at this now it's very very charming it's it's powder <laughs> cleanser we used a okay. different brand of powder cleanser in our house i was thinking of bona for whatever it's worth there's a hardwood floor cleaner called bona oh. b-o-n-a that somebody introduced me to a while back but uh bona me is that how you say this powder cleanser? i don't know there's so bona me there's so much stuff i'm having trouble pronouncing today i love this can isn't though. it great though yeah. okay so we used to have the one that's in the the um yellow like tube Mm -hmm. so i'm seeing a bunch of pictures of this now are you looking at the one that's basically like a yellow kind of cardboard with a foil type of thing tube have you seen that yeah like kind of a like when you say a tube you almost mean like a pringles can or you mean like a tube of toothpaste yeah 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 that's what i'm looking in fact this is going to be the show pick as that is so so reminiscent of my childhood as a kid. Mm. There was just so much of this around for some reason when I was a kid. And that hasn't scratched yet thing just really lodged in my brain, as you can tell. And maybe Anna Anafi's as well. I don't know. But I do know that Anna's been listening since 2020 because she just told us. Uh, Anna says, I sure have gotten a lot out of those years. It's amazing how quickly one can learn the inside jokes. Well, that's because we got about five of them and we make it every day <laughs> that's Anna. right i don't want to take away i don't want to you know steal your <laughs> valor on this but um some of it is because you're a quick study but some of it's because we got to get some new mm-hmm. material yeah absolutely uh, uh it uh also um let's see here uh the jokes i've now begun to speak the language of tbtl and also you can annoy your friends and family with constant drops and shushing them while the pod is playing. Oh, no. Ooh, Anna, that's a, that's a good way to really damage some friendships. <laughs> really I can is. only imagine Anna trying to shush someone and then the person going, oh, okay, I'm, I'm about to hear something. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then and it's, it's just more of this. And then it's this. Oh, no. I'm worried. I mean, here's what we know. Here's what we know about shushing. Or, hey, oh, this is the good part, right? This is what oh, we know yeah. about this just generally in life. Whenever we do that, even with quality products, it never works out. Like if, uh, so many times I've said to somebody, oh, oh, no, this line in the song, this is the mm-hmm. line. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear this. And universally and invariably, the person just kind of like is like, oh, OK. Mm-hmm. It's never the way to get someone to enjoy something more, to be like, oh, check, check, check this out. Oh, this is so funny when he says this. And yet I do it all the time, and it never works. And that's with things that are actually well-made. Can you imagine shushing someone to hear this? There's this song. I don't even know if I want to say... Well, I will say it's a Michael Christmas song that was one of my like they're not only just a, a song that I love, but one of my favorite moments in, mm. in, in hip hop was embedded in this one song. And I'm sure I probably shushed you and made you listen to this one moment. And I think you appreciated it. But I was in the car, I've ruined the song for myself now because it's a cringe moment for me every time, because I remember being in the car with Genevieve and saying, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. She's like, yes. You've played that for me a million times. I've heard it. And like she had, I, I don't remember playing it for her a million times. Uh-huh. I probably maybe had done it once before or whatever, but she wasn't like, and this is very rare. Like we'll, you know, kind of tease each other or whatever about like me and like kind of repeating the same joke or we're getting too excited about something. But like mm-hmm. in this moment, and I'm sure she has no recollection of it. I'm sure she has no idea that she ruined my life. But just in this <laughs> one unguarded moment, she was like clearly like actually irritated because I, I, she was mm-hmm. probably also talking and I wanted her to hear something or something. And right. she was just like, Yes, I know. I've heard it. And it was just like it was pure, unadulterated annoyance at me and rightfully (laughs) so. But now whenever I hear that part of the song, instead of bringing me joy, I feel shame. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna, for donating to this. This is a special. Andrew, this This is is the best part part. of Anna's daily uh, dazzling donor (laughs) message. I don't have anything personal to plug, uh, but I find it fitting to mention the Ravenna pop up kitchen. If it hadn't been for Andrew mentioning that they needed more volunteers, it would have never occurred to me to go looking for this specific volunteer gig. I've come to look forward to Sunday meal service and some of the entertaining regulars. So any Seattle who want to and are able should join us. You can prepare for food, serve food, or both. It's a great uh, team of caring and dependable folks. Uh, thanks, Luke and Andrew, for your dedication, and thanks to all of the guests, hosts, and callers, and especially the kids who tell jokes. Yeah, good call, Anna. Um, We need more kid jokes. Mm -hmm. 206-414-8285. 206-414-TBTL. Hit us up with those kid jokes. Always good content. 
uh, I value this community of weirdos. That's Anna saying that. I, mm-hmm. I'm not allowed to call it a community of weirdos. No, we asked you to stop saying that. Anna in the is. Marketing uh, to, I believe cease and desist was mm-hmm. the specific words your attorneys used. Yeah. The fact that we have different attorneys is weird. Didn't start and off expensive. that way. Didn't start off that way, but it def- definitely became a need. Weird thing is, my attorney's name is Danny, and so is yours. It gets mm-hmm. really, That's really what adds to the confusion. I did want to um, say, Anna responded to, I think, a tweet that I sent out back when I mm-hmm. tweeted. Did, so that tells you how long ago it was. I think it was a couple of solid couple of years ago now. I just said, hey, if we're you mean you know, Twitter, the platform previously known as X. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are, are they going back? Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> how about if every time we talk about Twitter, we go, what X now? Like if you just have to also re- like because no one ever wants to say X. Right. We all yeah. have to say the thing that used to be called Twitter. But like now if we say Twitter, we have to say the thing that's now called X. And I think they still they still call it tweeting. Right. But it's the platform like you would still send out a tweet on X. Is that true? It doesn't matter. Don't answer that. It's I don't, an X. Yeah, I really it's honestly, truth. the whole thing is exhausting. But um, I don't want to say that a couple of years ago I did put out sort of a hey, if you want to volunteer with this group. Uh, and Anna was one of the people who replied and, and she's been out there like I think almost every single Sunday since and that wow. that is not what is called for by the way if anybody does want to volunteer just you know if you want to make sandwiches twice a year that's fine or even come join us outside you know every four or five months one Sunday like whatever is fine you don't have to have that level of commitment but I think it's worth noting Anna's level of commitment I think mm-hmm. Anna's like me I think she enjoy I was just hanging out with Anna yesterday it feels like we're just kind of hanging out and honestly like having Anna there has really been a, a huge part of the enjoyment for me I'm not just saying mm-hmm. that because she's um, she's sprinkling uh, all of this candy on us in dazzling yes. donor form uh, which I also very much appreciate but yeah Anna's become a really really good friend and just honestly indispensable to a pop-up kitchen so just personally thank you anna thanks anna for all you do we really appreciate you uh thanks and also to rachel and matthew for uh making tbtl possible today hello and welcome to top story Something started rumbling last week, Andrew. That was my stomach. Um, I apologize. <laughs> I've been thinking about it for <laughs> days. That was so rude. Can you move the mic further <laughs> away know. from your belly? It was please? unfortunate. J-Lo uh, put out a, an album and, a, and, and uh, a kind of a concert, not a concert film, but a sort of a movie with it. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't think she actually released it last week, but I started really seeing a lot in the discourse about it last week and the story around this, this album and, and particularly this kind of like extended music video kind of music fantasy thing that she put together to accompany it was, and this was from JLo's, JLo's own telling. Cause I heard her on morning edition talking about it in other places was that none of the labels, nobody with money really wanted to bankroll this thing. They all thought that it was kind of a bad idea financially. And so JLo had to pay for this herself. And I'd seen a number, I'd heard a number, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but it was in the neighborhood of $20 million. That some, like JLo personally financed this project to the tune of like $20 million. And when I heard her on Morning Edition talking about that a while ago, I thought, well, good for her. She's betting on herself. And she seemed actually quite likable when she was being interviewed. Um, she sounded relatable, but polished, but, you know, friendly. And I actually was texting Becca. I said, hey, J-Lo seems actually, I've never met J-Lo. I was like, J-Lo seems pretty likable in this. And she was kind of being pretty honest about the fact that nobody thought this was a good idea. And she had to pay for it herself. I like stories like that because nobody thought TBTL was a good idea. Mm-hmm. And the thing mm-hmm. is, they were right, Andrew. Yeah, I was this waiting was... to see if we were successful yet. I'm talking about J-Lo now. Oh. <laughs> they were wrong about us. Are you kidding me? Please. They... <laughs> we'll be the last podcast in existence, baby. <laughs> I know. They were, they were, they were right. loud wrong about TBTL, but they were loud right about this project from uh-huh. J-Lo because it is really, really bad and really unself-aware. And the thing is, $20 million is a lot of money, but it's not enough money to make like a, I'm not exactly sure how long this kind of movie thing is, but based on the clips that I've seen from it, there were some real, um, well, you know, when I gave that speech to the Oregon Banking Association and the feedback that my uh, agent got was that there was a real credibility gap. Mm -hmm. There's some real believability gaps in this J-Lo thing. One, she's like, 
in some kind of fiery melting down like nuclear furnace kind of factory and she has to like walk across some kind of a, like an eye beam to escape from this like thing that's melting down right and she's in like some kind of heat suit and she has like a it's like imagine like a like a a welder's helmet right that has like a little rectangle for your eyes over mm -hmm. it or your face and like She's supposed to be going over this, like, you know, kind of thing you have to balance on. I don't know what that, what role this plays in the plot of J-Lo's new, mm -hmm. like, music video movie. But somehow she has to, like, dance her way out of a incinerator. And the way that they've superimposed her face onto the little square of this, like, of this, like, heat-proof outfit she's wearing. It looks like something that you and I could have done in Premiere with at least with with 20 minutes of training you mean like they make it look like you can see through that square into her eyes because of course those yes, squares her those, face the, but her whole face though not just yes. it's not just the it's not just the little cut out of a welding helmet that would be around the eyes it's like cut out the whole face yeah because i think what they what they thought was this is a good this is a good way we want to show that j-lo is in here but also we don't really have to have her in there it can be somebody else, mm -hmm. oh, but we can sure. superimpose her face. It, as if they just do her eyes, it's not as convincing. So I think they thought this was a good solution. Somebody thought this was a good solution. Like, cool, it doesn't have to really be J-Lo um, walking on an I-beam as like uh, something is incinerating around her. But we can put her face in and you won't know the difference. But we do know the difference. It's not very convincing. She does a kind of a, like a singing in the rain style dance at the end of the movie where she's got a... A um, uh, an umbrella and there's some kind of a theme with a butterfly I think the butterfly is like her soul or her spirit and, and a hummingbird I think maybe it's a hummingbird some like little fantastical thing is kind of flitting in and out of these various scenes and it's very singing in the rain it's not like a street it looks like it's a, like a street in, in Manhattan somewhere and she's kind of walking kind of in a jaunty way with this umbrella, which people have noted is exactly like some of the scenes of Corky Sinclair practicing his <laughs> dancing in Waiting for Guffman. But like what has happened is because this this kind of movie video thing um, is is it's not great. People have they started off kind of roasting it a little bit and and w which there's also a lot where Jennifer Lopez is. PR team, presumably at her direction, has also done a lot of stuff within this movie and I think in other circumstances to try to sort of like portray her as a real relatable person and also as a like a, you know, somebody who who has very humble beginnings. So one of the things that keeps coming up is there's somebody doing like an interview with her. I don't know if this is part of the movie or not, or this is part of the publicity package for the movie. Can I interject some... just for one second? Because there are, you, I, I don't know if you said this or not. There are two movies that go along with this project, right? There's oh, there the, are two. Okay, so you have you have her new record, and then you have this sort of music. I, it's described as a musical film that comes out, uh, out along with this it. This is album, me now. This is me now is the name of the record, and this is me now. A love story is like sort of the video component of it, and then she also. Um, you know, funded and produced her own documentary about her relationship with ah. Ben Affleck called The Greatest Love Story Never Told, ah. which is on ah. Amazon Prime. And I'm pretty sure that she has funded all of these things. And so I wasn't sure what your thoughts were on all of this. And I haven't been seeing as much, you know, social media barrage about it because I'm not on those websites. Well, you're hanging out in I've the been, wrong part of TikTok, but, my friend. But I've been hearing, you know, I've been sort of hearing just ca casual conversation about this. And so I wasn't sure if like if you were going to be talking about. Yeah. So the, another conversation kind of issue people have is her in this documentary that she's made herself just like Michael Jordan and all these and, and Tom Brady yes. and everybody who wants to make their own documentaries about themselves for legacy shit which I kind of do have an issue with that um, and like sort of talking about her relationship and shining a light on a relationship that failed the first time because there was too much light shining on it and so it's just sort of like it's all kind of complicated in there too I yeah I, I would say that the the Ben Affleck stuff, I'm kind of less read in on. Like um, the the other than people are saying, it seems fairly clear that even Ben Affleck agree, agrees that this was not a great idea. Like that to 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 talk about their 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 relationship in this way in this documentary that she's also ultimately signing off on. Um, but as far as the like their first round and their breakup, I don't really know a lot mm -hmm. about what people are saying about that. But what I do, and thank you for the clarification, because you're right. I was kind of blending the like the music video component with this like documentary that she's that she's also kind of had commissioned 
and she's kind of getting roasted on both fronts. The documentary, what what people are are kind of a little put off by, and by a little I mean a, a lot put off by, is like there's one scene where someone's asking her go to bodega order, and it's like it seems like it's a very staged thing that's supposed to kind of be like a a way to just like really establish that she used to go to the bodega and that mm-hmm. she's very New York and that she's very kind of like just understands the day-to-day life of a, of a New York person and the order that she lists. So it, it, there's like a few things. For one, it's like, obviously whoever asked her this question was probably told, Hey, ask her, her bodega go to order. Like it's one of those things that's supposed to be real cash, but it's probably, there was probably a, a team of people, including JLo who yeah. thought, thought this through as a question, but it's, you know, it's shot with like a cell phone kind of a thing. It's real mm-hmm. like verite. And what she says is like, um, she goes, Oh, uh, my, my, my go-to bodega order. I can't find the tape. So I'm just paraphrasing here. She's like, uh, a ham and cheese on a roll. Um, an orange drink, if you know, you know, and a bag of chips. That's my go-to bodega order. When I tell you, Andrew, how much the internet, particularly folks in New York, particularly mm. particularly folks in the Bronx, are breaking down how silly that order is. Mm. <laughs> like, they're like, what do you mean orange drink if you know you know? What are you exactly talking about? Bag of chips? Nobody sends someone to the bodega and says, get me a bag of chips. You go like, get me wrap snacks, mm-hmm. get me Doritos, get mm-hmm. me... Uts. Like yeah. no one would say Tuckies. bag of chips. Right? Like like uh the the people are a little more generous about the ham and cheese on a roll, although they're all like it's a bacon, egg, and cheese with salt and pepper. That's just like the default order for most people. I mean we can't we can't say for a fact that she didn't ever order ham and cheese on a roll. That is possible, but there's just a vagueness to the order. Mm-hmm. Orange drink if you know you know, and a bag of chips. I will accept a bag of chips. Of whatever kind, like there's just something about it doesn't really like doesn't have the ring of truth to a lot of the people on the Internet who are then like listing what their exact orders Mm -hmm. would be. There is the scene, though, in the I think this is from the documentary where she's, I think, been working out. I've only seen the, the I haven't seen what precedes this or what comes after it. But there's a scene where Jennifer Lopez is, I think, taking her hair out of some kind of, um, you know, I don't know, like ponytail holder or something. She she looks like she's been like exercising really vigorously. Maybe she's doing choreography, practicing choreography. It's, it's my understanding. I can jump in here because I'd read about Good. this this morning. It's my understanding that this was another kind of uh, issue of contention with people in the Bronx. Something about like, well, you know, in the Bronx, we run up and down the block. When I was well, a yeah. little girl, we ran up and down the block. So I got the impression that this hair situation was tied up in this exercise that she was doing, running up and up and down the block, which uh, some people said was not really a thing. I. I Maybe I think I'm wrong. so. Okay. I think what I think the sense I have from watching the video is she's been, she's just gotten done training or working out and she takes her hair out of whatever like thing and she starts teasing it out. Not unlike your beard before mm-hmm. a big appearance on KUOW. Yeah. And she goes like and she starts shaking her head and her hair's all kind of sweaty and, and sort of unkempt in a way. And she goes and she's like sitting on like a weight bench or something and she's like Oh, my hair's like this. It just reminds me of being a little girl in the Bronx, mm-hmm. just running up and down the streets. Crazy girl. Just a crazy girl in the Bronx. <laughs> and it is like just it's having the opposite. Whatever they were hoping people's read on this would be, how it would make people feel, at least the corner of the Internet that I tend to hang out in, it is really having the opposite effect, including People who went to the school that Jennifer Lopez went to, a lot of people, like I'm talking people who more recently than her went to the same school. She went to a very, what appears to be a very beautiful um, Catholic high school in the Bronx that was like on the river. And I don't know what her status was. I mean, she may have been on scholarship. I, I don't know her life outside of the school. But the point that's been made by a lot of other young women who have also attended the school was this place was amazing. <laughs> the teachers were great. The students were great. It's on a really nice street. It was a really good place to go to school. And it did not have this feeling. And the Bronx as a place isn't necessarily this sort of wild atmosphere that Jennifer Lopez wants to project to the world as far as her like, as far as like her legitimacy, her background. Um, but the thing is, what this has unleashed, and this is the part that I'm the most interested in, and this is the only reason I'm even talking about this with you, Andrew, is because I feel like this is a real moment of karma i don't believe in karma but like if i did this would be a moment of to me 
karma really showing itself to be a thing. Because what has now happened on the internet are tens if not hundreds of people who worked at various levels of entertainment, usually in like production assistant or hair and makeup or other kind of that strata of the entertainment industry, sharing their stories of times that Jennifer Lopez gave them the worst interaction they've ever oh, had oh, with somebody bummer. in their, in this mm -hmm. position. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I tend to believe these folks is because a number of them will talk about a project that involved Jennifer Lopez and a number of other famous people. And they will say things like, and so-and-so, so lovely, just it's totally nice. And so-and-so, great, really great to work with. And so-and-so, like these aren't people who are just like perpetually disgruntled. Yeah. They're just like people who are like, I, I, I worked with this person and they were awesome. Um, J-Lo, not that. Mm, that's not that at all. Yeah. Like people who took, people who worked in, uh, on the promotion side of like Power 106 in New York, uh, a young woman who was going to get to take a picture with J-Lo because J-Lo came to the radio station to promote something. And just like her story of just complete, in her experience anyway, J-Lo just not in any way recognizing her as another human being who walks the earth, but just as a sort of prop to stand next to, to take a photo without any eye contact or conversation before the next prop moved through. Like just story after story. People who are saying, my parents worked in the high limit room at the Aria and, uh, and, and uh, JLo and Ben Affleck were in there. Again, this is just someone's story, but like saying, and Ben Affleck left a very healthy tip of a few hundred dollars, and then at some point Jennifer Lopez came back in and took back about $170 of the tip. Stories that just have a lot of specificity, and I can't verify them, but I have to say they just don't sound impossible to me. Mm -hmm. And like, the, the thing that seems to, if these stories are to be believed, and again, I don't really know why so many people be making them up and with so much consistency, and what I haven't seen is one person on the internet saying, I was, you know, you know, I was a person who was who was who was had a terrible illness and I was in the hospital and I looked up one day and there was J Lo, you know, standing next to Russell Wilson. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. Yet there was only one me a... set of footprints somehow. There's still <laughs> That was when Russell Wilson one. gave J Lo a piggyback ride. Like <laughs> that's right. It was a fun, sexy time. Actually. There's nobody saying I had an interaction. It's like Trump. There's no one saying I had an interaction with this person and it went better than I was hoping. It's just only mm, people going Kid Rock would like a moment. Of your time. <laughs> Weirdly, as it relates to both performers. <laughs> he, he was on J-Lo's back, and Russell uh, Wilson was giving them both a uh, piggyback ride. It bum, It kind of bums me out. Like, I uh, I didn't know about this. I hate the... I, first of all, I'd always heard that... I'd not heard one thing about J-Lo one way or the other about her interactions yeah. with people. Nor, nor had but, I. But I'd always heard that Ben Affleck was actually quite likable and affable, which always kind of makes... I Like, it's weird that, like... I, you mean I kinda, quite affleckable? Affleckable, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's nothing in this I want to say, Andrew. Affleck. I don't... <laughs> Sorry. Um, Affleck. Just, there's, yeah. there's nothing in this, by the way, that uh, I haven't heard one person saying, and also Ben Affleck was there being rude. Like, yeah, it, yeah. There's, there seem to be no accounts of that either. And that's what causes me to feel like there is some believability to a lot of these stories because, again, it doesn't seem like anyone's grinding any axes with anyone else or. It, it just all kind of the, the reason that I think the karma thing feels true to me here is because what it reads to me is not that Jennifer Lopez is an actively a bad person in the world or is getting up in the morning wanting to make people have a bad feeling about themselves, but that she's also somebody who this is totally just my speculation. She probably from a very young age wanted to be a superstar and worked really, really hard to become a superstar. And probably when she got to that level after all of the hard work and luck and all the stuff that goes into that, probably kind of thought, yeah, I earned this and I'm going to enjoy it in the way that I want to. And that means I'm not going to be worried about every person who opened the door for me getting out of the car at the hotel. I'm not going to worry about every production assistant uh, who 
uh, was there to hold the shade over me while I was, you know, standing off, uh, like just out of the frame waiting for my shot. Like she doesn't seem to be based on these accounts, a person who thinks about other people in the world who she sees as not relevant to her experience or not necessary for her to sort of like spend a lot of time worrying about how do they think about her. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's not a crime. And there are lots of people that go through the world that way, but there's just something about, th I don't, I don't like that as a way of being in the world. I don't like that for people. And the idea that like for so long, it sounds like she was just going through the world, kind of being just not as nice or thoughtful to people as she could have been. And now the people who mostly didn't have a lot of power in those situations have this power. It's called the internet. It feels like a leveling that I, or, 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 or I don't know what you want to call it. It feels, it feels to me like this has sort of been a long time coming and I, it makes me think that there is a, a, a loving God. A little bit. Of, it's comeuppance is the word that you That's maybe want to use. You. And it's a fun word it to say, word. honestly. It is. I like that word. Uh, one, let me clean up one thing that I muddied up. You're right. She was in the gym when she takes down her hair okay. and says, quote, when I was, this reminds me of when I was 16 in the Bronx in the Bronx that was me that's not part of the quote <laughs> she, <laughs> no that's tape that's actually tape of Jayla <laughs> she can she can't say the Bronx saying that uh, the messy waves of her hair remind her when I was 16 and in the Bronx running up and down the block but she was in the gym so sorry for messing that up as you were you were correct and I was muddying the waters there not that it really matters that much I suppose but yeah you know I I wasn't sure where you were going with this story I don't have really any opinions on JLo uh, generally speaking she's mm -hmm. in a movie that I like that is actually in the same universe as Jackie Brown, even though it's made by a different um, production. Oh, out company. of sight, out of sight. Exactly. I love Those that. Are, movie. Yeah, yeah. So, like, that's my only point of reference for her. And, um, and I thought so, she was great uh, in that film, by the way. Yeah. And do you realize that that's the same characters that is just played by different actors who are in um, Jackie Brown, which is no. by far my favorite Tarantino film. But anyway, is that um, like an Elmore Leonard I or something? I think they're all Elmore Leonard, I want to say, okay. because Rum Punch is the one that okay. Jackie Brown is based on, and then there's that, and oh, then there's okay. another one with... Um Jennifer, oh my gosh, I was doing so well with Celebrity Talk there for a second with Jennifer from the television Wits, show Friends. The head of Friends, the TV the head show of Sirius Friends. Satellite Radio. Uh, oh, Jennifer Aniston. Jennifer Aniston is also in a, in a third movie that is part oh, of the really? universe. Yeah, all, but anyway, and I saw that in the theater, and Genevieve and I were halfway through it before Genevieve turned to me and said, "These are the same characters <laughs> from those other two movies." Like we didn't even know going in. Anyway, having said all of that, um, so I don't have like an opinion on her sure. her art or how she moves around the the world. Most of this is new to me, except the one thing that isn't new is the only song I could possibly name by her because this was pop music during uh, I mean I'm not good with pop music anyway but this was specifically during a time when I listened to no pop music kind of the the early 2000s when I was only listening to public radio constantly so huge blind spot for me but the only song I'd possibly be able to name is Jenny from the block and I don't sure. even know if that's the name of the song but we know that the, that's the yeah. theme of the song right yeah don't and, be fooled by the rocks that I've got I'm exactly still, I'm still Jenny from the block and so for, and I remember the reaction that was a huge hit if I recall but also yeah. I do remember there was pushback right away like why is this woman making this argument so strongly because because you clearly right. are not Jenny from the block. Like there seems to be something in her that she's she feels like she constantly must try to prove to people or convince people establish that, her bona fides that, <laughs> that she has good Bronx bona fides. Her bona fides. <laughs> Bronx of fides is what they call them. I <laughs> really, is no, that a show? Hey, title? if you know, you know. If you know, you know, Bronx of Fides. Um, so anyway, it's like it's such Anna a gets it. <laughs> this is the part where Andrew says Bronx of Fides. It's such a it's such a strange thing. And, and you do get the I mean, this might not be true. I might want to take this back. But you sort of get the impression that the people who are arguing so or who are protesting so much uh, about mm -hmm. their um, about their possibly more cushy background or the people yeah. who, you know, d d you know, d didn't have the hard background that they're bragging about your vanilla ices of the world and maybe your JLos or whatever. Um, and so, yeah, that that's always seems to have been something that sort of is like her whole thing. And now she's like tripling down on it in what could be sort of a, you know, like the whole, it sounds like this whole project is sort of like, I don't think she's made a record in 10 years or more or something. And mm -hmm. then she even describes this sort of as like, I, I don't want to put it in her mouth if she didn't say this, but like, 
you sort of get the impression that this is sort of her her opus, sort of her wrapping up of, a, if not a career, an era of her career. Mm-hmm. This new album, I think she her original album was This Is Me Then, and yeah. now this one yes. is This Is Me Now. So it's all kind of like full circle as a, yeah. as a human, as an artist. Like, that must be compelling to do or whatever. But, like, this obsession with, no, I'm the person who, who um, really has street cred. Let's just call it that, or Bronx cred, or whatever it is, Bronx of Fides. Um, <laughs> but then when you're like, I believe the world will be calling it Bronx of Fides <laughs> going forward. But like the but the fact that you're like the furthest from that, like that kind of that bums me out, but does doesn't bum me out as much as I've heard that she like sort of punches down or like does not see the humanity and people who are quote unquote below her. Like that that really does suck for for me to hear. Cause I, basically I always root for celebrities to be likable and for their yeah. relationships to last. I think you're sort of a similar way. Like I yeah. I, I want celebrities to sort of buck the trend and say, like no true you know true love or however you see it I don't want to make it sound like breaking up or divorcing somebody is necessarily necessarily a failure because sometimes relationships not. just go that direction who are you talking to that's fine too I don't want to you know for real I think that's important to say like this stuff shows up in a lot of different shapes and forms but anyway I always I always think wouldn't it be really great if like what 30 years from now like Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez are in there what would that be like 70s or 80s or whatever it is and like still just be like kind of casually a couple who are out of the spotlight but they made it Pulling work a like real that. Kurt Russell Goldie yeah, Hawn exactly. type of sit. yeah that always makes me happy so Absolutely. I always kind of root for that kind of stuff and I don't think there's any indication that their their love is hitting any kind of uh isn't hitting the skids at all I <sighs> I well, did you hear about the part where he finds out during the documentary that she had shared? <laughs> sorry, now let's just get now let's just get the claws out. Ooh, explicit. <laughs> she like she, I, apparently, and again, this could all be kayfabe. I haven't seen it, but like, <laughs> like apparently, he finds out while the cameras are rolling that she had shared his love some of her. Some of his love notes that he wrote to her, she shared them with other artists for inspiration for lyrics or something like that. Was and it he Fat didn't... Joe? Did <laughs> yeah, she share let's it with face Fat it, Joe? It was probably Fat Joe, and it certainly wasn't the Dun Kings, and that's where it really, <laughs> that's where it really hurts. I mean, th- to me, like all of this is just through the lens of that Dunkin' Donuts commercial because, like, we saw her in the. She was working. I mean, that is like kind of part of the storyline in that yeah. Dun Kings commercial with yeah. Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. They're trying to crash the record that we're now talking about right now. Yeah. Fat Joe is in the studio with her. Well, he's listed as one of the producers on This Is Me Now mm-hmm. and on the movie. Yeah. The not the documentary, but the um the like music video movie. Yeah, they and, collaborated. And, and that was another thing too. Um w- w- you just actually we'd reached a nice end point for this. So let me <laughs> just ex- it's only 90 minutes into the show. Yeah, that's um it, the other thing too is my understanding is The reason that I'm so fascinated with this, Andrew, is because in a certain way with the documentary, she's doing something. I think her attempt is to do something that I actually always enjoy when it comes to content, which is really pulling the curtain back. So if they're rolling on the moment where Ben Affleck finds out that she has kind of overshared some of their personal life with some people and we get to see how he really feels Mm -hmm. about it. Like I find that content very, very um, compelling. That's true. Um, and, and and so the, I think that one of the other things that they include in the movie, in the documentary, is a couple of people that are helping produce the the music video movie are listing to J-Lo all the people that have turned her down. Mm. And it's like a long list. It's like, it's like so-and-so, and these are all famous people, obviously, so-and-so is a no, so-and-so is a no. This person can't make it. This person would love to, but they're otherwise booked. And like, it's... That's also being kind of memefied, but it's funny because it, it would appear that all those people kind of knew something. Yeah, like you're you're sort of you're you're putting that up there, like, look, I had to prove myself against all these naysayers, yeah. like all the haters. We were talking about that it last week. It only right? works. Like- it only works when the haters were wrong. <laughs> right. If the haters were right, if Bill Hader turned you down and he literally knew what he was doing, if the <laughs> if the haters were hating in the right direction your film really falls apart. And that seems to be what has happened here. Like, I love everything about this documentary idea, except for the fact that 
all of the doubters were right. Yeah. And that really right. kind of pulls the rug out from the whole thing. Although that's kind of an amazing move too. Like I could sort of see myself doing that. Like like kind of like <laughs> listing. They said I couldn't host a podcast. They said I couldn't start my own business. They said I couldn't be on T on KUOW's weekend. They said review. I couldn't shave my entire they beard the morning of a KUOW appearance. And they were right. All of these things have just been massive, massive failures. And I wish I just taken a moment to hear them. I think it'll be interesting to see if, because JLo is nothing if not a very savvy entertainer and performer. I mean, she's had a tremendous amount of success um, by way of, I think, hard work and 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 reading what the kind of vibe is. Maybe this, maybe these movies in this album are uh, like a notable misstep. But like, it will be interesting to see how she responds to all of this, and if, and not even on the like. PR side of it in terms of like is she going to make another concert movie or whatever you want to call it on the like personal level the next time that Ben Affleck and JLo go out to get dinner I wonder if there is any part of JLo's brain that will be kind of telling her hey maybe maybe mm. eye contact with the server maybe mm. like be a little more friendly to the person that opened the door for you when you got to the restaurant like I just wonder if this mm. is the kind of thing that might actually live in her head a little bit so that she is maybe a little bit nicer to the people in her life who who previously she wasn't really ranking as important or if it just will harden her approach yeah. that all of the small people and I'm putting that in quotes are are sort of out to get her and beneath her and I I wonder if this will have any impact on her actual behavior in the real world. That's interesting. I mean, I don't mean to be um, uh, a naysayer about that or a hater, but mm -hmm. um, if I sort of feel like where she is in her life and her popularity and everything, mm -hmm. like if that if that change happens, I feel like it might be short lived. Like I just it, it seems like, you know, maybe she got burned in this moment. Was it James Corden, by the way, who we were? I'm, I'm sort of thinking of like, wasn't he like yeah. publicly roasted for yeah. like for he returned an egg that wasn't cooked to perfection or something. And then all these other stories came out about him being like pretty. Yeah. Pretty rude to servers. Yeah, not people. a particularly yeah. I believe I believe his it might have involved an order his wife made yeah, at a particular he, restaurant in New York and um and then they were by by all accounts not nice about the sending it back, et cetera. And then now the I will say this. The I also think the owner of that restaurant, which I can't call back to mind off the top of my head. Yeah also seemed a little extra like yeah, he definitely, definitely like, used that as a moment to then he didn't like, miss the chance to get into the discourse with that right, right but but you're right yeah that was kind of a a public a public reckoning if you will for james corden and his wife allegedly being less nice to servers than they should have been or could have been yeah and you wonder like hey maybe for something like james corden maybe that does change the way he acts a little mm -hmm. bit does it change fundamentally who he is or does it just make him realize there are cameras on me which i'm fine like, with yeah either way if, if it's it, I guess totally it externally motivated but it changes how you are to the servers i'm yeah if you're only doing it because you don't want to get roasted on tiktok i'll take it here I go once again with the email. Every week I hope that it's from a female. Oh man, it's not from a female. All right, we did not get to talk Portland Pickles, um, but we will talk about it tomorrow because it just delighted me all weekend. Yes, I want to say that that story, you, you sometimes talk about how certain stories that pop up in the news cycle remind listeners of TBTL because it clicks or checks a bunch of boxes or whatever. Uh -huh. There was a moment yesterday where my phone <laughs> kept buzzing and every time I opened it up, it was a text message. <laughs> it was an email. It was an Instagram DM or whatever. Like there was just one moment when something went viral that was specific to our kind of universe here or, or a joke that we like to come back to that everybody thought of us right away. And it's, that's always sort of a fun moment. Um, yeah. So I want to talk to you about that tomorrow also i love that it's the pickles um no we gotta get you down to a pickles game yeah Andrew. absolutely maybe maybe we'll be um maybe i'll down be there for a down couple there of for various couple baseball of baseball games. events yeah hmm. watch the space hmm. um okay so um let me play this one voicemail for you here luke and then we'll get out of here i think this was just like i think it was last week you were tell you were talking you were telling and talking so you're mm -hmm. telling i do me, both you were telking me yep. about um you told are you talking to me? <laughs> hey, I, you talking to me? 
I'm trying God, to. That's bad. I'm trying to do less Travis Bickle in my life because it's such <laughs> is a that what that's to. from? You talking to me? You talking that? Yeah, that's uh, him. I think, and it's I like, don't... and then the, I, you know, my whole <laughs> bowling nickname being the Hard Rains. Oh yeah, yeah, that was like I need to, I need to, I need to rethink <laughs> my relationship with Travis Bickle. <laughs> quote. Anyway, um, so you were talking on this show about an experience you had on stage uh, during a taping, a very special taping of Live Wire very uh, last weekend, um, where. You, I'm sorry, who were you interviewing again? I'm blanking on her name. It was not Jennifer Aniston, but when you were starting to get sort of heckled. Um, oh, oh, Cheryl Strayed. Cheryl Strayed. For the um, record, I wasn't being heckled. Cheryl yeah. Strayed was. Everyone in the yeah. room agreed I did an amazing job. There, <laughs> there was somebody up in the balcony who was like kind of yelling down at her like during the interview saying like, why are you putting your, your mother, mother-in-law in Front Street with this personal yeah. essay or whatever? And yeah. like it was just like a, a thing. And you talked about how you had to react to that on stage. And it was somewhat awkward. And I made an offhand uh, a comment about you having the Hells Angels <laughs> as, oh, right. as security guards, which was, I guess, in, you had to tell me what I was referencing Altamont, I believe, was the festival with yeah. the, the Rolling Stones and things mm-hmm. went sideways and they had the Hells Angels as security guards. So anyway, I made that brief reference, uh, which led Julia to have a uh, a memory she wanted to share with us. Oh, hey, Luke and Andrew. This is Julia here in Bozars. And I just want to thank you for your heckler broadcast. <laughs> Talking about Hells Angels as bouncers, what, one of the things that happens when you get old to remember stories from your past. My mom comes or up forget with them. Mm-hmm. So I know that when we were younger, our parents uh, did these concerts at Satsup. They were the con- helped with the concert organizing and apparently one of those, the Allman Brothers stole our family's truck, which is very strange, but <laughs> in this case So I kind of I kinda miss that. Julia said that the Allman Brothers stole her family's truck. Did I just hear that right? That's what I heard and it also, I mean, it checks out. I feel and that's like it's a very Allman Brothers, <laughs> Allman Brothers thing. You never hear like the platters stole my parents' yeah, truck. But the Allman right. Brothers, you're like, yeah, I'd buy it. The B-52 stole my truck. <laughs> Oh, the B-52s <laughs> stole my toaster. <laughs> and it's as big as a whale. And it's about to set sail. Um, I have a question for you. Is it the Allman Brothers who do the song that mentions a street corner that you and I stood at in Arizona? I think that's the Eagles. Oh, that's uh, the take Eagles. Take it easy. I'm standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Got right. seven women on my mind. That's the Eagles. I believe that's the oh, Eagles. Okay, gotcha. Because we did. Or stand maybe just corner. Eagles. Isn't that part of the rumor on that band? Is it was. It's just the band is just called Eagles. Smashing Eagles? I think it's the <laughs> Smashing Eagles. I'm not sure. Anyway, okay. So the Holman brothers apparently stole the family truck. That's not this story, though. That's for another no. day. My mother has remembered another story from this, which was that they did have Hells Angels as bouncers. And in that time, everyone wanted to get paid in cash. And, of course, the concert goers paid their tickets in cash. And because of the outdoor nature and all of the Hells Angels, my mom didn't really feel safe, but she explained she had to wear all the money on her body. She was walking around, and the Hells Angels were somehow poised up on a truck filled with watermelons. It became a fight. It's just one of those stories where, like, well, thanks for telling me this now. (laughs) When I'm old enough to really appreciate it, but thanks for everything you guys do, and uh, so all we know is uh, Julia's mom is wearing the money on her body because that's uh-huh. the only place it feels safe. The Hell's Angels are poised up on a watermelon truck. I don't know if they are keeping Julia's mom safe or eyeing that money, but also a watermelon fight breaks out or a fight breaks out near the watermelons. I, I, I interpret it as to be the Hell's Angels are just chucking watermelons off of this truck at people, which... I guess a water, a full-on watermelon could be kind of dangerous. It could kind of sure. hurt you, but it does. If they were slices, like if let me put it this way: if the if Hell's were Angels cubes, were, if the nice Hell's Angels cubes. were going after me with something, I pray it's watermelon. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true too. Yeah, versus <laughs> bullets or brass knuckles or all the other kinds of things. Also, um, no offense to the mom in this story, but I'm just I don't want to. I don't want to tell someone how to live their life thirty years ago or however many years ago this was. But if I have a bunch of something that I'm worried the Hell's Angels want, I'm not putting it closer to my body. 
Well, I'm still trying to figure out, are we protecting the money from the Hells Angels or are the Hells Angels also keeping, because they're the security guards that are hired, right? Can you not, are we, and, but the whole and point also, is you were can't the trust Allman Brothers own. at this? Had they stolen the truck yet? I don't know if this is related to the Allman Brothers story or if oh. that's another story for another time. I'm not sure. I love the idea of the Hells Angels having a, like, a melon baller, though. And they're just, like, very <laughs> carefully, like, maybe scooping out little bits of watermelon and just sort of gently tossing them into the crowd. Hey, Snake Eyes. <laughs> Can I get the melon baller after you're done with it? <laughs> sure, El Diablo. Ugh. Stop bringing cantaloupe. Nobody likes cantaloupe. <laughs> Actually, I think I like... we need an... Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to tell you a, about my we thoughts We need a new cantaloupe. segment called Things That Happened to Julie's Parents. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, uh, Julie, hold your calls because... Um, Please, honestly... Can we get? Can we find out if the Allman Brothers were at this thing? What happened to the money that your mom had like bound to her body? Mm -hmm. Did it make it to the intended recipient? Uh, and who was that recipient? Uh, did the Hell's Angels bring their own melon ballers, or did they mm -hmm. borrow some? Right. I mean, there's again, uh, so often is the case on the show, we find ourselves with more questions than answers. And where's Trace? Exactly. I mean, if there's one thing we. <laughs> There's one thing we, we still wonder at the end of this episode of the show. It's what happened to Trace, and did he get Andrew any pens from Tropical? I'm, you know, Tropical, Andrew, I had a whole other perception of that place based on the pens you got me, which I figured it was kind of like a sort of quirky 70s, you know, breakfast cafe in Palm Springs mm. somewhere. That place was that place was hopping. That place was the, the place to... To, to see and be seen in Palm Springs. Um, yeah, you know, our friend Christy Wise took me ah, and Genevieve there okay. and let us know about it, and she knows Palm Springs really well. I think ah. her parents live there um, okay. or have some sort of connection. Um, and, yeah, that was it was a really nice day. It wasn't like a club when I was there. It was just like a really nice, like, old-school, big, like, kind of uh, dinner place, you know, with yeah. like old-school booths, and you'd, yeah. I was, I, I honestly was, like, envious of those who were getting to eat there because I was on my way home mm -hmm. to DoorDash some Greek food, which, by the way, Andrew, Good. yes. Oh, the food was fine. Uh, did the guy picking it up drive deep mm -hmm. into the mountains of Palm Springs for some reason before bringing mm -hmm. the food to me? Yes, he did. Maybe I he swear. was picking the olives. That's why they were so fresh. Mm -hmm. um, I still haven't told you, and I will tell you tomorrow, I promise. My uh, some big news I have for you about the end of TV. I don't mean the end of the show is existence. I mean how we end the show. Something happened to me when you were out of town, Andrew. I had a revelation about this mm -hmm. very moment of the show, this part okay. of the show we're doing right now that I want to talk to you about. Okay. Uh, I'll try to remember to do it on tomorrow. If, if if the point of this is it was better without me, I don't nope. want to hear it. No, 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 hear no. It. no right. it wasn't. Uh, all right. Thanks for listening, everyone. We're going to be back here tomorrow with more Imaginary Radio for you. So please do join us for that. In the meantime, have a great Monday. Take care of yourselves. Watch yourself when you're shaving. Mm -hmm. And please remember, no mountain too tall. And good luck to all. I like taking my hair out like this. It reminds me like when I was 16 in the Bronx, running up and down the block. A crazy little girl who used to f be wild and no limits, all dreams and Power out.